Basiru Fai, a name once whispered in the confines of prison walls, now echoes through the corridors of power as Senegal's youngest president. From the depths of confinement where the shadows of doubt loomed large, he emerged not as a victim of circumstance, but as a beacon of change and promise. As he stood before the nation taking the oath of office, a new chapter unfolded in Senegal's history. From prison to presidency, Basiru Fai's story is not just his own, but a reflection of the collective resilience of a nation. It serves as a reminder that no obstacle is unsurmountable, no dream unattainable. His emergence not only signifies hope for the younger generation in Senegal, but other African countries. What lessons are there to learn from Senegal and the state of democracy in Africa? Well, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Jibrin Ibrahim, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Democracy and Development. Thank you, Prof, for joining us. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, so Senegal, um, a moment of historic significance happening today, or has already happened. He has been sworn into office at the age of 44, Basiru Fai. Absolutely. I think it's an important moment of transition for Senegal, a country whose median age is 19 and 70 percent of the population are young and increasingly these young people have seen a fracture between their lived realities and the focus and interest of government and therefore felt that it had reached a stage where they had to mobilize themselves and change to a government that will work for the interest of all. I think it's in that context that it's an important moment for the country. Indeed. Um, the road to the presidency was not easy at all. It was very rough, in fact. So Fai and his uh, colleague, Usman Tanko, were languishing in jail uh, because they had been hounded by the administration of uh, former President Macky Sall. Um, so it's not easy to withstand the power of the state. It takes a lot of bravery, don't you think so? Absolutely, they've been through trials and tribulations. Both Usman Sonko and Basi Rufai were civil servants, tax inspectors when they started politics. So they were sacked from their jobs. Uh, and I think over the years, especially when they showed a significant inroad in the 2019 elections, the focus of President Mikey Sall then was to make sure these young people will never get to see power. They've been thoroughly beaten up by the police, they've been jailed, and they've been marshaled through court after court trying to pin crimes on them. Mikey Sall was very clear in his determination that he will not allow any of them to succeed in the presidential bid. And at the end of the day, I think it's a strong statement about Senegalese democracy, that a sitting, a, a sitting president says you'll never be allowed to contest. And yet, at the end of the day, they are able to contest and win. That's a wonderful way to um, sum up what happened in Senegal. And the other interesting thing is that the Senegalese populace, you know, went through all of this, you know, they stood their grounds and decided that they were going to have their candidate. What does this say about citizen participation and engagement in a democracy especially? I think it's uh, the character of Senegalese democracy. This is not the first time it happened. In 2000, President Abdou Diouf was determined to continue in power and there was general mobilization of young Senegalese by the then Abdullahi Wad who defeated Abdou Diouf in the 2000 elections. In 2012, the same word who defeated Duf on the basis that Duf had been in power for too long 
wanted to change the constitution to get a third term. And it was in that context that uh, he was able to now mobilize to win. Now that his time had come, he didn't want to go. So that was the rise of Maki Sal. Maki Sal came out, mobilized, was brave, was very clear that Abdullah Awad must not be allowed to have a third term. In fact, I was at the Place de l'Oblisque when Maki Sal was addressing a, a rally and the president sent soldiers and policemen who tear gassed us and scattered it. That was the leadership Maki Sal showed in 2012. He was also a relatively young person in his early 50s when that occurred. And in that speech where the police came and tear gassed us, Maki Sal made the argument that the Senegalese people will never allow anybody to have a third term in power because there's a limit to which you are no longer really committed to governance and you have hubris of power that takes control over you. Now that same Maki Sal who made that brilliant speech in 2012 was the same one this year, or since last year, who changed the constitution, who insisted he must have a third term and there has to be a massive mobilization across the country to stop him. So the Senegalese have that tradition. They did it in 2000, they did it in 2012, and they've done it again this year. Thanks very much, Prof, for taking us back into the history of what um, Macky Sall said before and then. I mean, it was seen as a breakthrough when he became president. Everyone fought for him, you know, to defeat what? And then he came in and they refused to go away. But the constitutional court in Senegal overruled Macky Sall, telling him that he cannot um, extend or postpone the elections. What does this signify in terms of the courts and the judiciary? Very important in a democracy. Absolutely. You know, when uh, the saying goes that when your time has come and you don't see the end coming, then the gods make you mad and you behave in certain ways. The Constitutional Council had actually been very obedient for a very long time to Mikey Sal. But he got so desperate towards the end, he was attacking everybody, including the Constitutional Council, which had the right to make this decision. And his biggest shock were when the Constitutional Council turned against him and said, we are no longer ready to take this. We have a constitutional tradition to preserve and we will not allow you destroy the constitutional basis for democracy in Senegal. I think that was a bold statement. It was very brave of them to do. Certainly. They did it under serious risks and threats on their persons because immediately he got the sense that they will not support him. He got the Ministry of Justice to start investigating each of the judges to see if they could pin crimes of corruption on them. So it was a very difficult moment for the country, but I think at the end of the day, they stood firm, and that's good, not just for Senegalese democracy, but for democracy in Africa. Definitely. So the leader of the opposition organization, Patriots for, of Senegal for Works, Ethics and Fraternity, Pastor of Usman Sanko, I mean, he was the one favored to run for this election, to be on the ballot. But he buried his ambition to support um, Fai, obviously because they had pinned a couple of things on him. He had undergone trial, but that was not the case with Fai. So he was a candidate that could fly more easily. Um, I think this says something about personal ab ambition uh, and the overall good. He sacrificed that in order to move ahead with the main purpose, which was that Makisa must leave office so that the Senegalese people can have a fresh president. Absolutely. Usman Sonko had a very clear vision. His vision was that 
Mikey Sal was a terrible president for Senegal, and the first objective is to remove him from power. When, therefore, Mikey Sal blocked his own ambition, and Usman Sanku is the charismatic one, he's much more charismatic and much more popular than Usman Sanku, who was been his secretary actually for a very more long popular time. More popular than five. Yeah, much yeah. more popular. But I think it was really that wisdom to say, well, if they won't let me, then let one of us take over the race. And the idea is that they will, when they win, run a collective government. And I think all eyes are on them now to work closely together, given the joint struggle they've been through. Uh, they've been president and secretary of that PASTEF party for the past 10 years. And I think over that 10 years, they've developed a very close working relationship. And the moment to reap the fruits of that strong working relationship has arrived. So they have fought hard, and now they are, they are here. They are relatively inexperienced in terms of executive governance. And so on a scale of 1 to 10, this is something that worries some people. How important is that type of experience for governance? Because when you're a president, it's much more complex. It's not easy at all. It's not the same thing as an activist. Maybe one could think of it the other way around. When Macky Sall became president, for example, he had been president of the National Assembly, he had been a minister, he has a long history of corruption behind him, he'd been in executive power for so long, and look at what he turned out to be. So maybe these two young people who've never had executive function, who have always had clear policy directives, directions they want the country to follow, may be in a position to surprise us by moving that country forward. Of course, this is something we don't know. A lot will depend on, for example, the ability to get good advisors who will guide them along the way and to work in a larger coalition to bring other political forces that will carry the Senegalese nation in its uh, entirety. If they are able to do that, it may not be a problem that they haven't had executive experience in the past. Well, a lot of expectations on their shoulders and everyone will be watching. So let's come to Nigeria. Do you think that what happened in Senegal can also occur here? Absolutely, because uh, the demographic profile of Senegal and Nigeria is identical. That's the medium age for both countries is 19. And 70% of the population of the country, and therefore the bulk of the voting population are young. The problem we've had in Nigeria is that young people have been dismissive of uh, politics. But I think an important change started with the Peter Obi phenomenon during the last election, when a lot of young people became interested in politics started re registering to vote, and I'm sure that trend would continue. This means with an expansion of the voting public towards the younger generation, it's absolutely possible to have a new personality that embodies change that the youth believe in could emerge and win power in Nigeria. In fact, my message to the youth is that they just have to do that. But you know that Senegal is only 17.3, I think, 32 million people. Nigeria is over 120 million, with a very diverse um, country, different religions, and, and all of that. Don't you think that is a factor that might pose a problem in our country? Well, the Nigerian population is over 200 million. It's now yeah, 20 yes, million. Yes, over 200 so, million, my mistake. Uh, it's yes. even larger than that. I think it's not really the number of people, but the idea of having a platform in terms of political message or narrative that unifies the country. What Usman Sonko and Fai did was to develop that message, to say since independence, Senegal has been completely under the control 
of French new colonialism. And the resources of the country have not been used adequately for the development of the country. The institutions, such as the monetary institutions, are all in the control of France. There is a defense pact between Senegal and France. So successive Senegalese presidents have not really had the belief that they could exercise the sovereign power of the country. So that message went across. And people say, well, we can change it. I think the challenge in Nigeria is to develop a discourse, a narrative, that will unify the people around an idea of how to move this country forward. And once that emerges, I think the possibilities are great. Let's push further down that line. Um, you're very correct, but with, without diversity, do you see a Nigeria where we can truly, irrespective of you know, religion, ethnicity, be unified under a platform to move us forward? Do you see that happening? In the near future, especially. I see that happening because what are the fundamentals? The key defining attribute of Nigeria is that we have the largest population of poor people in the world. Secondly, we have the largest population of children of school going age not going to school. The majority of the people of this country, therefore, have a stake that this system must change if they are to progress. Precisely because the political class in this country know that, they become very divisive in the way they play politics. So they focus on, oh, this one is Christian, this one is Muslim, this one is Igbo, this is Hausa, etc. It's a divide and rule tactic. And what we need is a new political messenger or new political messengers that could clarify the sight of Nigerians so that they understand these are divisive politics that has kept us in bondage all these years. We should see beyond it, look at the reality that there is a tiny percentage of the people of this country who pocket all the resources of the country because they are in government or because they are in parliament. And the mass of Nigerians are in abject poverty and no access to social services. Once that message gets through, the possibilities, as I said earlier, are endless. The electoral body in Senegal played a huge role. Here in Nigeria, what do we need to do about our own electoral um, institution? Because it's very critical to a free and fair election. The challenges we fa faced in the past, what's the way forward? I think uh, I was an observer in these Senegalese elections. I've just come back from Senegal. And I was really impressed by the organization of the elections. The normal Nigerian stories did not appear. That is to say, materials didn't arrive in time, something is missing, the police didn't turn up. Secondly, there was no violence, there were no issues. I think the third issue that I found uh, quite impressive about the Senegalese uh, uh, elections is the fact that they were able to allow radio and TV stations to announce results as soon as they are pronounced in the polling booth. So that the elections ended at six. Results started going, coming out by seven. Between seven and 10, virtually all the results from the polling units have been announced on radio and TV. And you see everywhere people with their biro and paper noting down the results, using calculators to add it up. By 10, everybody in the country knew the results. So there was no issue of going to coalition and beginning to play tricks as sometimes happens uh, in Nigeria. I think that's an important thing for us to adopt in this country. As soon as results are announced and pasted at the polling units, broadcast it 
so that the whole nation hears it. We've tried the technology route with the last election, with the system of posting out, uh, posting down the elections directly on the website, but unfortunately a glitch occurred and that didn't happen and that created a credibility problem for the uh, last election. I think one of the thorough discussions we need to do is to focus on multiple modes of transparency in terms of transmitting uh, election results and that will address one of our key problems. The other really surprising thing in the Senegalese election, which I think uh, is a problem for their elections, is that there's a ballot printed for each candidate. So there are 19 candidates in these elections. And you have the 19 ballots set out on the table. And you can take any number of ballots you want before you go to the voting booth to uh, vote and at the end of the votes they just throw away the ballots and i was saying in a country where you have more crooks than they have in senegal people will organize uh, collect those ballots and go and stuff the ballot boxes but i think the fact that they have been voting in that country since the early colonial period as you know there were four communes in uh, senegal that were since the early 20th century considered to be French citizens and they've been voting in French elections there for, for a very, very long time, for so about 110 so years. So they have that culture of vote and in any polling booth, citizens are, the watch, are on the watch out to make sure that there's no tricks that are uh, occurred and that the rules and regulations of the elections are closely obeyed. I think that's really a statement about political culture. You see, um, FI has become a phenomenon in Africa. And uh, what do you think are the implications of that for, for the rest of us? A, a lot of African countries still have a very long way to go. I think uh, part of the thing that has been placed on the table in West Africa and in Africa in general is how do we exercise our full sovereignty in a context in which globalization has reached its limits and countries in our category are feeling that we want to really exercise our citizenship. As Fai said in his, you know, in his victory speech, after the uh, results uh, emerged, his commitment is to pursue this, not just in Senegal, but in West Africa. He is, for example, extremely keen that we come up with a new currency for West Africa that's completely under the control of the governments of West Africa and not any foreign power. So he will give the Philip to the attempts by ECOWAS to build the eco currency for West uh, Africa. He's also very keen on this issue of having defense pacts with foreign countries. And he's saying we should take our self-defense as a national and regional responsibility. I think the third issue that is placing on the table is question of transparency and accountability. That public resources are for the public good and must be oriented for the general good of the population. I think these are all issues that are of direct concern to us in Nigeria because on all those uh, fronts, we have a lot of progress to make. So we do hope this push he's going to give on the policy front and on the political front will be something that's positive for our entire region. Let me, let me take you on the Francophone-Anglophone divide and stretch it further. Historically, there's always been that attempt, especially by France, 
to make sure that the Francophone countries are together and not working or in alliance with the Anglophone. And it seems like with the new wave of leaders coming up, or interest and knowledge and information across Africa, that barrier is breaking down. How good of a news is it? And do you think that it would take quite a bit of time to dissolve completely? Well, you know, the important things are happening on the question of the Francophone world. Uh, three Francophone countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, have sent France packing, have broken the defense pact with uh, France, and have decided to go their way. So that's a major political movement. Of course, it comes with the problem that these are military regimes that are also turning their back on democracy. And Fai, in particular, in his speech, committed himself to working with these three countries to bring them back to ECOWAS and back to democracy so that we can push forward this question of unity. And now, with France increasingly being pushed out of these three countries, and is likely to be pushed out of Senegal, French influence in West Africa is definitely going down very quickly. Okay. And that's an opportunity for everybody to seize. Okay, Professor Gibran Ibrahim, thank you for a brilliant conversation. Please come again. Thank you for your time. I'm ready to come back, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you. We'll see you soon.